Tracy Bowdy, our field crop entomologist at OMAF and the MRA. She's going to talk a little, something about seed treatment strategies for 2014. And we're also going to have uh, Dr. Art Chafsma up, our field crop uh, pest management professor at the University of Guelph. And he's going to give some insights on reflecting on uh, communicating seed treatment options to the public. And uh, Tracy has been the field crop entomologist program lead with Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Ministry of Rural Affairs for the last 13 years. Her recent areas of focus include research and extension work on western bean cutworm, soybean aphids, IRM for BT corn, and uh, monitoring for new invasive species, including the brown marmorated stink bug. A major portion of her time is currently spent addressing the issue around neonicotinoid seed treatment and risk to, risk to pollinators during planting and the development and strengthening of the best manage management practices to mitigate this risk. She is a member of the Ontario Bee Health Working Group and the Agricultural Plant Health Strategy Working Group. Tracy is also helping to advance OMAF and the MRA communications efforts in social media and is the lead author of the Bowdy Bug Blog. And we also have Art, Dr. Art Schaffsma, is currently uh, co-advising three uh, Masters of Science students and two... Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you cutting me off, Art? It's okay. You guys want to get into this? Yes. Yeah, That's can. good. You guys all know Art. Yeah. Well, he's one of our professors at Guelph, but anyways, he's going to, along with Tracy, give us some insights on the, on the bee uh, thing that's been happening over the last couple of years. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bright light. So um, I, I want to start off giving credit where credit is due. And uh, you're looking at an incredible person here, Tracy. And uh, she has taken the heat on this issue like no one else in Ontario and has been doing it for a number of years. And uh, we owe a lot to Tracy. Uh, lots of evenings and, and nights and stress, and so there you go. And so I'd like to acknowledge Tracy for, for her outstanding. And I do have to point out, though, that she hasn't been doing this work for 30 years. That means that I could never have trained her. <laughs> so Tracy was, uh, fortunately, my first graduate student, so uh, we cut our teeth on each other. It was, uh, <laughs> we still cut our teeth on each other once in a while. Um, so what we want to do uh, is, is kind of, uh, I was asked to speak, and we were both asked to speak on this, but we were uh, trying to get to a point of how to communicate things and talking to the public and so on. And, and it was kind of tough to fit this all in, and, and, and the urgency of the issue is, is such that we wanted to try and steer the conversation a little bit to where we're at, how did we get here, and then we can talk about how do we communicate some of these things that need to get communicated really quickly. And so uh, I want to make a couple of comments before, before we, we start. So how did we get here? Um, it goes way back, and, and, and so how do you educate people? So the, 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 the issue goes back to when honeybees first came to North America, when the schools and the kids in the schools get taught about the role that honeybees play in pollination and, and, and the impressions that are left. And, and I'm not trying to make a, a comment whether something is good or bad, I'm just saying how deeply seated some of these impressions are. And, and so the normal person, myself included, grew up thinking that honeybees, without them you couldn't have any agriculture. And, and we can debate that, but, but that, that's an impression that's left. Um, if we could, um, are you moving slides? Good. And, and so um, the, the problem we have is, is, is uh, there are a number of things that happened over time. In, in the last 10 or so years that kind of comes together and we have a situation that is quite significant and, and, and we need to deal with it in a very careful way. So this is a group of folks that had no idea what they were getting into on March 15th and they all got thrown into this and uh, it was an incredible amount of work and so uh, kudos to them. Next one. And very quickly there were a number of groups that were able to pull some fund, funding together so that we could get a, a handle on what was going on. Uh, in particular it got started with the uh, Pollinator Park Partnership, the Corn Dust Research Consortium. Okay, and that money was able to be leveraged and 
through lots of efforts behind the scenes by various government folks and so on. And very quickly they were able to pull something together. So next one. So let's go back to when things start. So it starts with, with the bees. Bees are very important. No one disputes that. And, and, and they're, 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 they're key to lots of pieces of agriculture. But back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, we were running into problems with insects. There was challenges around what insecticides were available back then. So we were talking about lindane and diazinon and people stirring things around in the hopper boxes. And we all kind of remember those days. And so there was a, a worry about exposure and there's a worry about persistence in the environment and so on. And so along came these new neonics. And they were quite remarkable, very effective. And the reason for getting excited about them at that time was, well, if we could treat things properly, we could have less exposure. These things are not as toxic to uh, humans and, and mammals than their predecessors. And so there was an opportunity also to use them as seed treatments. And so you would keep them in one place and they could move in the plant. And so there are lots of good arguments for going in this direction. And by the way, they were very effective. And so here's a, a couple of shots where you see wireworm in, in corn and wireworm control in wheat and just keep right on going. And, and so in the early days, corn very quickly grabbed on to this idea and probably within about three years, I would say that you know, the neonics penetrated almost all the corn acreage uh, in, in those early 2000s. And the thing that is also in the background is the impression that has been left, and it, it, there's some reality to it. The fact that plants look good if you have them treated versus not treated, even in the absence of insecticide. It's very difficult to see that at the end of harvest, but everyone understands you know, if the plant has a good start. And so that picture is in everyone's mind. And then along came 2006, and we had uh, bean leaf beetles showing up for the first time as a wintering pest and lots of spraying went on, we all remember those days, and then suddenly, you know, we found out that bee leaf beetle could be controlled by a neonic, and then there's a major shift into the production or the use of neonics on, on soybeans. And uh, we'll just keep right on trucking here. And at the same time, there's this issue brewing, and it kind of coincides with, with, with what's happening in the neonic world, is this idea of colony a collapse disorder that's kind of happening or you know the world over and there's a lot of debate about why this is happening and you know some are arguing that it's mainly uh, varroa mites and uh, some argue that it's varroa mites plus uh, a, a, uh, a virus that's uh, you know connected with it there are several viruses being implicated and 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 then obviously they, they talk about the insecticide piece and particularly the neonates are being fingered and so how does this all play out? And, and, and there's a lot of media and a lot of opinion. And so you don't want to also forget that there are opinions and there are points of view and, and there are lots of things at stake. And so it's very different. This is an issue that I, I've never run across before where, where you have such deep-seated opinions. And, and, and so one stakeholder says this, another stakeholder says that, and it's really hard to get uh, somewhere in the middle. But I contend that every stakeholder has a piece of it and every stakeholder has to give a piece to get to a right place. So another thing that happened to get us to where we are today, the introduction of air planters, vacuum air planters. That happened relatively recently and happened very quickly and so we have uh, dust coming out of these air planters and, and all kind of coincides and then carry on. Next one, uh, then we see lots of uh, opportunity for this dust to drift. So we'll talk to you in a minute about the implications of that. But that has happened since 2012. Next one. And so uh, 2012, all heck breaks loose. And poor old Tracy is tearing her hair out. You could say I must have torn mine out too, but I, I wasn't involved back in 2012. I only started in 2013. And Lots of reports of neonic bee kills, and uh, at the moment we're confident that you know there's a reality to this. We have a, there are bee kills associated with neonic dust escaping planters. Okay, that's that's not not something that we can dispute anymore. Uh, but there's a there's a perspective here. So 42 reports, which is two percent of the 2000 in 2012 of the beekeepers, and the number of hives seven percent of the hives. 2013, the numbers go up. 
And so we have this storm that is brewing and concern. And the other piece of it that is lumped into this is, okay, we have an acute situation here. We have something that's happening to bees. We can see a cause of that. The big unknown is what's happening to the lower levels of things that are in the environment and so on. And, and what, is, what is the chronic or long-term or, or um, uh, sub-lethal effect? And, and the unfortunate thing is those two are being lumped in together and one's piggybacking on the other. I think those arguments need to be made separate. So next one. So uh, I admit I dragged Art <laughs> into this and I do appreciate his efforts as well. Um, we were able to establish uh, nine sites. We hoped for ten, but our tent beekeeper uh, actually had just some serious overwintering issues prior to planting and we, we had to drop that site. But we had nine growers with 16 row or, or bigger, up to 24 row uh, vacuum planters and gave us uh, fields of 50 to 250 acres in size, paired together um, somewhat reasonably close uh, and all within of two to three kilometers at, at most from a bee yard with a cooperating beekeeper as well. And each of these fields, one was to be planted with their conventional lubricant, the talc or the graphite blend, talc graphite blend, um, and the other one planted to the new bear uh, fluency agent. So these were the main sites that we tested for this year. Based on the Corn Dust Research Consortium's criteria for funding, they wanted two questions answered. The first one being, what are the flower resources? that honeybees are going to during the planting in and around these fields. So we're going to do upfront conclusions um, and then give you the, the rest of the data. So one, very few honeybees are actually visiting these dandelions around these fields. Only a fraction of the high pollen that we collected um, was from dandelions. A majority of the bee pollen that we collected from these hives were from tree species. And based on the scouting around these fields that we did every week, that matched the species that we were finding in and around these fields. So that was a big aha moment because it's not actually the lower lying flowering plants that they're going to, it's those trees. And, and some of them not as obvious that they're flowering like maples and, well, and willows um, like we're familiar with. Also, seven out of the nine bee yards that we monitored, um, we didn't see a relationship between the number of dead bees and the neonic levels that we were finding on the pollen or on the bees at that time. So, um, as I alluded to, we did scale these fields. So, uh, one week prior to planting, and then every week for six weeks after planting, we um, captured georeferenced with an iPad, no less, Lindsay, <laughs> uh, each and every plant species that we came across. And whenever the abundance changed, we also documented that. And what we found is within the early season, so anywhere from the end of April until the middle of May, we find, um, of course, dandelion being about 80% of the low-lying plants, and then garlic mustard, a, a new and newer invasive out there, and then the other uh, mustard species, all of the wild mustards and, and sh um, shepherd's purse and um, all of those. Mid-season, you would see a shift where you'd see bird's foot trifoil, um, Dame's rocket, which is actually a mustard, everyone thinks it's floss, but it's actually, it has four petals, not five, it's a mustard, and then uh, clovers as the big ones. But as I mentioned, the big aha moment is that it's actually the trees, and of course even the architecture of the trees make them much more dominant in the landscape. That being willow, maple, and then the, the large group of the rosaceae, or, or um, hawthorn, and dog, no, not dogwood, sorry, apple, and, and those species that are out there, basically from anywhere from the beginning of April to the end of June, uh, blooming and, and um, being there for the bees. So we also were wanting to look at how uh, the fields uh, were in context with local bee yards. And so we had a bee yard with each pair of field. Now, one has to be very careful how you look at that because there are other corn fields around, so you can't make a direct comparison between what's happening, but we can look at some relationships. So we did two things at these bee yards. We regularly took samples of dead bees in some of those wooden boxes with the screen over top of dead bee traps. And that's a normal thing. Uh, bees uh, will do housekeeping and bees do die and, and, and they clean house. And so the question is how much is a, a normal uh, bee mortality? Secondly, uh, we installed, uh, this is thanks to Cynthia Scott-Dupree at Guelph, we installed uh, pollen 
traps, and so the bee is forced to go through a little hole, and then the pollen uh, uh, grains are dislodged from the pollen baskets, and then you can uh, collect that and determine what's in there. And so, uh, again, uh, very similar to what we were finding around the field. So we did the survey around the fields. We're finding, we sent these pollen samples to a lady in Quebec, uh, who is an expert in uh, identifying pollen by looking through the microscope. Don't ask me to do that, but we, we did find an expert and in Quebec nonetheless. And, and so, um, everybody laughed at that one last time, but anyway, <laughs> maybe it's not that funny. Um, so, so we, Again, it follows nicely along with what we found uh, in, in the field. So again, apples, rosaceae is a big, a big player. Maples, which are acer, salix is willow. And then taraxicum is our little old dandelion. And so if you go step back a year, you remember a lot of people were fingering the fact that there was so much dandelion out there. And then there was a, you know, a linkage between the dust landing on the dandelion and bee kills. But we're showing quite clearly here that dandelions are not a real favorite source of pollen. And so there's some other things going on here. In particular, the bees are coming into contact with the toxin in, uh, when they're visiting the tree uh, flood blooms. We measured uh, the number of dead bees per trap, and, and so the numbers bounce around a fair bit. So there were nine bee yards, um, and so you can see the numbers range from uh, um, a, a minimum of, of uh, three per trap to, to something like 40. Uh, we, we measured uh, uh, just around, just before planting, our two fields. There could have been other fields being planted earlier than that, so one has to be careful. Two days after we planted our two fields, and then about a week after we planted our fields and the numbers bounce around and there's lots of debate whether that's normal or not and but the point I want to make is that all the bees that we collected had some level of neonic in them. Is that a cause and effect that that level killed the bee? That's another point of debate. Another point we need to make is, is that it was almost impossible to find pollen that did not have some level of neonic in it, so it's there. Um, and there are a couple of places where the uh, levels are somewhat elevated, uh, and so that would be uh, 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 yard seven and yard two. Okay, and so those, in fact, uh, were visited. I think all of them had the potential to be visited by PMRA, but those in, uh, specifically were visited and, and they were uh, checked and declared by PMRA to be sites where there was a confirmed bee kill due to neonics. So the point is, it's not unreal, it's, it's real, there's something that's going on. Now the second question that the um, Corn Dust Research Consortium had asked is what is the actual efficacy? How, how good is the um, bear fluency agent at reducing this contaminated dust coming from the exhaust of these vacuum planters? Our conclusions are that neonic contaminated dust is actually, it's a very real thing, it's venting out of these exhausts of the, the vacuum planters. Also dust leaves the, the field, um, likely from wind drift as well. So it, it, it's similar to spray drift. Um, during planting, we are drifting out of these fields. Planters using the fluency agent at the recommended rate, and we'll talk about that in a little while, saw a net reduction of the neonic active ingredient emitted from these planters by 28% compared with the standard lubricant that they were using. Dust emitted from the planter is related to the neonic uh, that we find on the dandelions downwind from these plantings. And that gives us compelling evidence because there is a relationship there that if we manage what's going um, from the planter, coming off the planter, we can help manage what is actually being found on those dandelions and, and likely the rest of the vegetation outside the fields. So what we did was each of our growers um, on, on their planters, we would put a virgin vacuum bag on one of the manifolds um, and let them run uh, through the field uh, two rounds and measured a certain distance that they traveled. And what we found when you looked at the actual weight of the dust that was in those bags is that you got about a 67.5% reduction in the bags that, uh, from the planters <coughs> using the fluency agent. But when you actually looked at the mean concentration of the neonic in that dust, it was actually 3.7 times higher using the bare fluency agent compared with the lubricant. So taking those two factors into consideration, um, the actual overall weight of the neonic active ingredient being released um, with the planters using the bare fluency agent, you saw a 28% reduction 
that um, compared with the um, conventional lubricant. So it, it is helping reduce the amount of, of neonic active ingredient escaping. We also set up we also set up towers similar to um, Kristen Krupke, another um, key researcher on this issue in, in North America. And it, it involves having a two meter high um, metal stake with a, both a horizontal and a vertical panel that contains five microscope slides that at the last minute we spray with a tangle foot, which is really super sticky, um, to capture the dust. And we set these up in three replicates at a zero meter, a 10 meter, a 50 meter, and a 100 meter distance from the planting. And what, um, what we have here is the zero meter. We're still almost done analyzing the rest of it. Um, but what we're seeing is immediately at the zero mark, right at the line of planting, we are already capturing <coughs> neonics on both um, whether it was conventional or the Bayer fluency agent at two meter high mark as well as the horizontal. So there was real, no difference between those treatments. And that indicates to us that it is getting up and out of those vacuum planters pretty quickly. And that poses a risk to being blown out further into the field. And I can say based on Christian's work, he does capture it all the way up to the 100 meter mark and only sees about a 10% reduction every 20 meters. Uh, so you, you, uh, it clearly is escaping these fields. So as, as it happens, dandelions kind of factored into things uh, because we were fortunate to find dandelions at every one of our locations. And we took it upon ourselves to capitalize on that. So uh, opportunity uh, is, is something that you want to take. And so we sampled uh, blooms that were downwind of our trial area. So, so it was another way of measuring what was going on. And then we analyzed what was in and on those blooms uh, for the neonic and tenoid concentrations. And so we were able to compare fields that were uh, planted using the conventional, uh, what the farmer was using or the producer was using, and we were able to compare that directly, uh, somewhat directly, because it was a different field, the, 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 the area where the Bayer uh, uh, fluency powder was used. And again, uh, you know, there's a lot of variability in numbers, of course, and, and uh, the, 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 there is no statistical reduction in the level of neonics that we were capturing collecting on the, on the blossoms downwind on the edge of the field. Now we took another look at the data and we said, okay, we, we saw a fair bit of variability of, of uh, levels of toxin leaving the uh, planter out of the, out of the exhaust. And so if you take that number and you relate that to the number that we're finding in the dandelions downwind and you do a correlation, which we did, uh, we might be able to see something. And sure enough, we were quite pleased with that relationship. So the point is, the less dust that leaves the planter equals less dust that lands on the dandelions. And so that is kind of a smoking gun that you know, we, we need. We have an opportunity to, to reduce uh, the problem and, and keep things home. Other things that we were uh, looking at that we weren't asked to do, but we just went ahead and did, uh, we were looking at uh, non-bee pollinators, or non-honeybee pollinators, I should add. Um, we were looking at what are we finding in soil, what are we finding in water, um, what is being collected by uh, honeybees during corn pollination, and what levels of neonicotinoid insecticide is there in corn pollen that's coming from those fields that we were studying. So, uh, you want me to take it? Okay, so, so the uh, one thing we did learn was, was uh, comforting in a, in, in, in a way because there's a lot of debate about how long neonics persist. And some folks argue that it's less than a year, some is, is, is short as a half a year, as a half life. A half life is how long it takes for half of it to disappear. So, that's what we mean by half life. And some uh, argue that it's as long as three and even more years in, in, in the field. And so uh, it's a raging debate. It makes a big difference because the more persistent the material is, the more likely it is to accumulate in the environment and create, create uh, additional problems. And so our, our conclusion is the data support a shorter half-life, something less than a year, more so than a half-life that is longer than a year. And so in, in Ontario, this, in the soils that we looked in, uh, that, that's the conclusion we draw. Um, the other thing that surprised us was uh, there seems to be 
potential for the neonic residues because they're water soluble to move up through the soil profile during periods in the season when there's lots of soil moisture. And as that water evaporates and the soil is drying, there's an accumulation of the residue in, in that very fine, thin dust layer. And that stuff is the stuff that gets picked up and moved when you're tilling and planting and so on. And so there was a concern. Now those numbers are, are not huge, but, but they are something that we need to think about. And in some cases, uh, we were getting, uh, um, uh, well, it was very difficult not to find neonics uh, in water. Just about everywhere we looked, we could find uh, levels of neonics, but at very, very low levels. Um, but there are uh, a couple of cases where we found some uh, pro problem levels in about seven fields out of the, uh, or, seven, or seven out of the hundred and something that we, we actually tested. And then the other surprise was that bees, in some cases, will forage quite heavily on both corn and soybeans uh, for, for pollen. So, you can do this, do this one. Okay. <laughs> Tracy doesn't like numbers. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, and so we were happy with this outcome. So we measured what was in the soil uh, in the seed zone where you're planting the seed, and that's where the neonics, you know, you can kind of assume where you, you'd add the, the next bunch. And so we wanted to see what was there before and after we planted. And we could actually, at very low levels, uh, measure the change before and after planting, that gave us some confidence, or a lot of confidence in how we were doing this work. But that works out to roughly the application rate. We could pick that up in our sampling method. Next one. So here's this little thing about the, the dust that we're collecting that's coming out of the field. And so uh, we call this a mock planter. It's a real planter, it's two rows. Uh, it's doing what a planter does, but we're not planting any seeds. The farmer wouldn't be too happy if we planted two rows across his field. He'd be kind of annoyed. Henry Donato would be especially annoyed. Anyway, so, so but we wanted to uh, duplicate what a planter might do and stir up the dust. And then we had a vacuum unit on there to vacuum that dust. And so when we compared the level of neonics in the dust that we collected to what we found in the soil below, okay, in that seed zone, there was about a tenfold difference. These are parts per billion, don't forget. They're a thousand times less than a part per million. So we have to tease this apart and figure out what this really means. Okay, I'll do this one. Um, we took approximately, well, we took many water samples. Anytime we saw standing water or a tile drain, um, we took a sample. And, and in particular, we focused in on the ones that we would consider standing water, which would be foraged typically by a bee. And um, out of the 103 samples that we found, uh, I will point out, we found neonics in all of the samples. Uh, all of the samples, but the vast majority of them were below 20 parts per billion, and or 10 parts per billion, sorry, 10 parts per billion being somewhere around the level where one might start seeing some impacts, some, some effects on bees, um, most of them being 5 parts per billion or less. But we do hone in on, the, there are seven samples that had much higher levels. And in particular, we can, when we look at those, those sites, there are a few anomalies that stand out, and, and one being that two of those fields, um, two of the samples coming from the fields that were replanted. So one of our cooperators, I won't say his name, um, actually had to replant uh, 17 days after the first planting. And so that initially, those two fields got a double application essentially. And so we were finding higher levels of neonics in that water. As well, um, a few of the fields had some significant rainfall um, shortly after planting that uh, stood out in our sample. <laughs> So th this is an interesting piece of data. Um, what we did uh, is around corn pollination time, we went out and we collected, uh, again, pollen that the bees were collecting at the hives. And then we bagged the corn plants uh, and collected pollen that had not been exposed to anything else. So it was coming from, we knew where it was coming from. And so we wanted to see what the bees were doing and what was in the corn pollen. And again, we had trouble finding one pollen that did not have neonics in it. And these numbers are somewhat consistent with what uh, others have been finding. Uh, Christian Krupke were, was finding numbers that are similar. There are a couple of little blips in the data. So the 33.3 on the, on the top line, number one, um, that we can attribute back to, uh, uh, it, it was the uh, 12.50, right? No? Replant. 
it was a replant. So, so it was one of the places where we had uh, more insecticide than, than one would expect. But by and large, you know, these numbers are in the PPB, very, very low levels, but it's there. What's even more interesting is there are a couple of places where uh, the bee yard is relying very heavily on corn and soybean pollen. And, and that's troublesome because beekeepers tell me that that's not necessarily a very good source of nutrition for bees. If that's all there is, then you know may, may, maybe maybe there's an issue there about you know what's accessible to the bees. Um, you have some other sites where uh, you have you know high accessibility to uh, you know, uh, sweet clover and, and and trefoil lotus is trefoil and and trifolium is also uh, is the sweet clover and so seven and eight for example you can see that they're you know having access to to uh, a, a more suitable source of pollen. So that initially um, wraps up our study, but we have loads of plans for this year again. A lot to do with um, investigating further some of those um, questionable concerning levels that we see in the other aspects, soil, pollen, uh, water, uh, that we'll continue to, to look for. But really it comes down to, as, as Art said before, we have two issues when it comes to the neonics. One being the acute poisoning happening during planting. Um, especially attributed to the vacuum factors. That's real. And based on this research and, and you know, others, it, we have an opportunity to actually have an impact on that. And, and hopefully if we can take measures, um, we can actually see these bee kill incidences uh, decline during planting. <clears throat> the rest comes down to the chronic, meaning that the bees are getting low doses over time that have an impact on their health, their ability to navigate, or their, their ability to uh, detoxify pesticides. And there is a lot of research that's still needed on this. Um, most of the research being done more on um, unfeel, unrealistic uh, levels of doses given to them. And even, we'll say too, it's mainly been on honeybees. And so there's a lot more research. We didn't even talk about the other pollinators that we found, but um, there needs to be more research on what the neonic impacts may be on those. And what I would say is, is maybe by addressing the acute, we can actually see some of these chronic issues come into more focus and, and maybe even also be able to be mitigated. So uh, those are the two, two aspects to this that sometimes get convoluted and di diluted within the social media that's, that's getting very frustrated. So as, um, as part of the extension side of things, we have been working, OMF has been working very directly with PMRA this year so that there's not mixed messaging and we develop best management practices and you can find them on both of our websites as well as um, other websites and, and I'm going to go through some of those particular best management practices that apply to you guys that we want to see you continue the message forward to your growers. Um, ensure that everybody takes and makes the best effort possible at mitigating this risk this year because quite frankly 2014 will be a year where everybody's watching to see if we can somehow find a balance to using these products and, and not have as much of an impact. Certainly don't want to see the same levels of, of bee kills that we've been experiencing in the last two years. It comes down to first of all um, going back to IBM. Uh, we're using it on nearly 100% of the corn acres and um, you know, some will say 80% of the soybean acres. And that, quite frankly, is not necessarily the percentage of acres truly at risk. We need to go back. And this is a table, and, and Pete Marie has been asking, what is the true value of these neonics? And this is based on the expertise of Art and myself and field crop entomologists and, and our own MAV staff. And, and, um, we truly feel, you know, the big culprit pests out there, um, particularly wireworms and grubs for corn, you're really looking at only 10 to 30 percent of the acres truly at risk of those pests. Where our work has to come in is, is to actually help you guys know where those high risk areas are and be more comfortable in going um, and using fungicide only seed when you're um, less at risk. So that's one of the, the big main goals is, is going back to IPM. These are insecticides. We, we really shouldn't be applying them everywhere. Um, we have pointed out that there is an environmental risk potential here. So um, really only use the, the um, treated seed, the um, Mionex, in high risk areas. Um, in particular, we know the sandy and silt soils and those with a, a heavy grass crop rotation are more uh, likely to have the wireworms and grubs. So if you're not in that area, perhaps um, try the, the fungicide only seed and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
And especially if you can identify yourself as having a field that is one, loaded with flowering resources, like the, the trees in particular, or two, you're very close to a bee yard, and in particular one that would be downwind. We're putting together an IPM booklet for you guys to help identify these pests, and um, of course the scouting and thresholds are all there or currently in the agronomy guide. It's just we've got to go back to re-educating everybody on those. But we do have a goal. So, so three take-home messages, use less, and then there's going to be a little discussion on use the fluency powder and wherever you can deflect. And, and I cannot stress deflect the dust down to the ground and slow it down. I cannot stress more that the eyes are on this. And, and if the numbers go up again, like they did in 2013, we're going to force PRA into a corner and we're, no one's going to be happy about that. So the producers really have to pay attention to this and think about those three options. Reduce it, uh, you know, use less, less often, uh, use the fluency powder to keep it from moving and deflect it if you can. Okay, and so one of the things that we also are being asked to prove and the burden of proof rests on the people that are using the insecticide. PMRA is not convinced that we need this stuff. So those numbers that Tracy just showed you are really best guesses. They're not based on hard and fact data because what happened was over the past number of years, we did these strip trials to see what the value was. Those strip trials are usually done in the best piece of ground on a farm. Okay, and, and so you might be missing something there. When we did the efficacy work to see how well it worked in a problem situation, we went to the worst part, right? And so we, we got the two ends of it. We can't put them together to get an estimate of how often it's a problem and how bad it is. And so we have one year to show PMRA that this stuff has, a, it has value and you need to convince yourself as well. And so we want to look at working with you folks to determine the key early season pests in Ontario, corn and soybeans, and to look at the economic impact of using seed treatments. So we can't do this unless we get a lot of points. 50 data points isn't good enough. So we need to come up with 100 data points for corn minimum and 100 data points for soybeans. We can't go out and plant these trials. It just isn't, it's impossible. Logistically, it's not possible. We can go though and follow up and sample and collect data. We can go and harvest these plots. We just logistically cannot harvest 200 fields of, of plots. So what we'd like to do is develop a partnership with OSCIA so that OSCIA uh, works with their members so that they plant these uh, trials as replicated, uh, a bag of treated insecticide uh, seed and a bag of untreated uh, side by side, same hybrid and so on. And uh, uh, we get notified, we don't have to chase it, we get notified, we'll go there and take the data, we'll go twice, and then we'll also pull all the data together once the yield data comes in from you folks as well. So this is kind of what the plot plan would look like. Now the fly in the ointment is who's going to pay for the seed? Well, I can't say that the University or OMAFR is not going to say the OMAFR is going to pay for it. But we're going to do some arm twisting. So we're not asking you folks to pay for it. We're going to ask uh, the C uh, Canadian Seed Trade Association to twist some arms so that everybody who wants to be part of this can have that two bag comparison, okay? So that's how we want to get there. And, and we're trying to make it easy, the plots, you know, line them up to, so that they're at least one combine width or two combine width so that it's easy to measure. Okay, and so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, commit between Tracy's group and myself to, to uh, collect all this information. And Jocelyn Smith, uh, who you probably all know as well, is going to be the, uh, the kind of the, the go-to person for uh, uh, making sure that this happens. So our ultimate goal is to help identify too where the problem areas are within Ontario and where they're not. And so that then you could actually maybe look at a map and say, do I land within the high-risk zones or not? And, and know with more confidence whether you can go with a fungicide-only seed when, when you want to. So, so we're going to ask you to plant that 
experiment in the part of the field that you think is the highest risk. Then you're going to draw a map of that field and you're going to put a line around uh, where you think that highest risk stops and starts. So you, if you have a few areas, you mark those out. So that we can then go back to the uh, uh, GPS coordinates and we can kind of figure out how big the field is. We can estimate the area. Okay, but then you're in the area where the highest risk is and then we can see what the return is in that area and then we can kind of relate it back to what the total area is and then for 100 locations we can get some really solid data. We want it across different soil types, different uh, practices and, and so on and we can't do it without someone we can't do it without someone uh, like your organization. Another important um, uh, key best management practices is to improve communication with beekeepers and vice versa. Um, we, it's really important to be able to identify where these bee yards are so that you can help uh, tell the grower, or sorry, tell the beekeeper which fields you're going to be placing into neonic treated seed so that they have the opportunity to either cover their hives or completely relocate them if necessary. But vice versa, we want beekeepers to start pointing out that, hey, did you happen to know I have a bee yard here? We do, there are plans in motion, there's funding available um, with GFO that we're, we're looking towards making a, an online map, an app, to help identify where these bee yards are and the communication, of it, whether it's just a text or an email, back and forth to each other, um, the beekeeper and the grower, so that uh, that communication lasts not only through planting, but through the rest of the season if you're applying other pesticides in these, um, in these fields. Another big one, though, is trying to decrease the dust drift in every measure possible this year, please. Um, one, obviously, being the fluence, using the fluency agent, and, and we'll talk about that. For the majority, it, it's mandated. Um, also, be, based on our dust drift layer that you see, um, that with that gator work, the mop planter, we are a bit concerned about potential soil erosion. You're seeing a lot of dirty say, um, snow out there right now. Uh, we want to start seeing less soil erosion. I think Adam and a few others would be happy for us to say that. Um, uh, it's particularly in spring so that we're not loading the, the vegetation on the outside of these fields. But another one is where appropriate, and I'm going to talk about this next, um, configure deflectors on these uh, vacuum planters in particular. So we're deflecting the dust down. If anything, our study is indicating that trees play a big role in foraging. And if we're letting the dust blow from these planters onto those trees, that's a direct exposure. So if we can bring the dust down to the ground level, we can keep it from getting caught up in that boundary layer and carrying through into, that, um, uh, into the vegetation. And finally, too, a recommendation. We saw tens of thousands of parts per billion with it coming off of these planters. Um, we suggest you know, cleaning out those hoppers and, and the um, actual fan housing on occasion between plantings to, to keep that accumulation from happening. So, um, deflectors. Well, one, I have to commend the, um, the manufacturers, the planter manufacturers, because they are developing new ISO standards coming 2015 for when these um, planters manufactured and sold after that will have um, a deflector or even just a complete dust mitigation technology on it. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to be buying planters after 2015. You guys have them now. And so the key is we've got to deflect that dust uh, in the meantime and so we have just based on when was that last co conference call uh, Friday. Friday we've got on board um, John Deere who has some kits coming from Europe that will fit some models and so some of this more information more detailed information is going to be released by Greg Stewart he's the champion of all of this but this is what we know so far. Um, Monison does have a factory built deflector that they will be able to sell. Kinsey, we've got Kearney planters in particular out of Highgate that has made a kit and I'll show you that. Case IH is still under development. Um, we're still having uh, discussions with them on that. But the actual physical components of these deflectors, it's not, it's not complicated, but there are some key features that you must have. One being that it is critical that you um, try to reduce the, the um, you don't get back pressure, essentially. So that means that you need to have a, a quite a large adapter and the initial tubes coming off of the uh, exhaust being quite large. And in particular, when you do the math, 
about a six inch diameter opening or greater is, is um, sufficient for the majority of the models, not all of them. But really what you're trying to do is, is give that air a big space to move. And a big one too, let me continue through, is that we need to slow down that air before it hits the ground. If you get a plume of dust coming off of the ground, then that's essentially causing problems too. So to do that is, is to have um, a tubing coming off, uh, particularly a wide connection if possible, so that you're actually diverting that air in two ways and, and sending it for a distance before it gets to the ground. Um, and then, or if you can only use one tube, then have a bigger, what we call a diffuser box, and I'll show you that too, that's larger at the ground level, close to the ground, um, to, to slow down the um, wind even further. And so you want to deflect it down to about a six inch level of ground. And once you get to the, the um, where it releases, you want to have some form of bristles or um, essentially a mat or, or broom to slow down that um, further. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's a Kinsey kit um, that Kearney has this stuff. You can see they've got two tubings coming off of the, the manifold. And once you get down to what we call the diffuser box, a, a larger apparatus near the bottom, we also have these, these um, broom um, bristles or, or even carpeting would be fine, as long as it helps to slow down that dust even further. There's uh, the John Deere kit. It's, it's a little more simplified. It's only one um, tube coming off, and, and they do still need to do some work on, on the actual adapter. The last thing we want is you guys putting duct tape at your exhaust manifold, but um, we're, we're looking at trying to find the right adapter to do this. But again, bringing it down to the ground um, with a, a diffuser box of some sort of larger space and the, um, again, the um, mat or the carpeting to slow it down. They plan to manufacture as well. Are they totally on board? They recognize the need now though, and um, they will say, you know, first when you put test your planter, run it at the typical R R um, PMs, then put the deflector on. Yes, you may see a little bit of um, RPM getting lower, but, but for the most part, you don't want to see much change in your RPMs. You don't want to see a lot of back pressure. Uh, they will not support the war or they may not support the warranty or the performance issues, for example, simulation that you might um, simulation issues that you might experience. But I think we all are in agreement that um, consider this similar to purchasing nozzles and um, try to do all you can to reduce dust drift during planting in any way possible. And finally, um, using the seed flow lubricant, the bare um, fluency agent. So starting 2014, this is a mandated requirement. PMRA has um, set this into legal motion. If a producer uses a seed flow lubricant for corn or soybeans, um, and they're planting a neonix treated seed, they must use the bare fluency agent. Uh, talc and, or the graphite talc blends are no longer available. So essentially, in other words, all pneumatic planters, if you ever have had to use the lubricant to move the seed through it, you must use the fluency agent uh, if you're planting neonic seed. If a producer requires graphite, though, to lubricate the planting mechanism, for example, the finger planters, finger pickup units, or the meter units within the soybean planters, then it's acceptable to use the graphite still. Um, so the rate for both soybeans and um, corn is one eighth of a cup per unit of seed, but we suggest you do not go above this um, for simulation purposes, etc. And um, it's also encouraged that you actually mix in that lubricant so that um, it, it's well mixed within the seed um, going through your system. Now, bringing it back to Lindsay and, and social media, I mean, we are trying to give you as much accurate information as possible. We have not only put our results um, on uh, Field Crop News blog, but also the, these BMPs. We also have within OMAF a pollinator website that also contains that information. And um, <laughs> if this issue has not taught me anything, if it's taught me one thing, it's that 140 characters is just brutal to try and communicate, especially science and, and results. And um, we have been trying to get crit critical information out, fluency agent in particular. There's a lot of rumblings going on uh, last week about what's real and what's not. So, so we've been communicating that on Twitter and of course um, to reliable sources. I'm not saying the rest of the field crop team isn't, but I know Peter's very active 
got both myself and Peter to uh, turn to if, if there's something going on out there in the Twitter world or elsewhere that uh, you need some clarification on. So with that, wow, I caught us on time. We got so so the, 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 the bottom line though is, is if we mess this up, <laughs> Uh, and I'm talking, I'm a producer as well, so I, I have a small farm, but I, I still take a risk. If we mess this up, we're going to lose neonicotinoids. I'm, I'm convinced of that. So we only have one chance to do this right, and so please do your best to reduce the amount of material that's leaving your farm, and please help us get the right data so that we can show that it's important.